As Libby mentioned, my name is Dan Glass, and I'm the program director for OEA's uh, Community Investment Program. Uh, just to give people a little bit of an introduction, since uh, uh, OEA is a small office and a very large uh, organization, uh, we are tasked uh, by the Secretary of Defense to provide assistance to communities uh, that are impacted by defense actions. We actually have uh, directions through uh, U.S. Uh, code as to uh, what is a defense action. But in that context, uh, we met the uh, Advanced Manufacturing Partnership for Southern California. Uh, we're able to uh, provide them assistance uh, to ensure that the good work that's going on here in Southern California can continue. Uh, and in that uh, capacity, I'm also honored to be the uh, federal point of contact for AMP SoCal. Uh, but today, I have the distinguished honor of uh, representing this panel, of moderating it, of uh, some, some very uh, senior experts in the defense field. They're going to offer, I think, a very interesting survey of some examples um, and context for uh, DOD efforts to assist defense manufacturing and the U.S. industrial base as a whole. Uh, presentations, they may focus on the what uh, are some of these efforts, but I want to touch on for a moment uh, a little bit about the why. Uh, specifically, in, in 2014, defense spending on payroll and contracts compromised or comprised about 2.4 percent of U.S. GDP. Uh, the Congressional Budget Office projected that uh, this level of spending will decline about 28 percent from 2011 to 2019, or a reduction of about $454 billion. Now, obviously, the, the Department of Defense is a large consumer of manufacturing goods, of, of goods from the U.S. industrial base. And there are some interesting things that are uh, going on with regard to how DOD uh, manages that relationship. Uh, it's, it's its role. Uh, and what we're going to hear today are some, uh, again, examples and context for that. Uh, I'm looking forward to this discussion, uh, but I'm going to provide a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, this is a one-hour long panel, but as again, uh, we're before lunch, I'm going to try and keep it to that. Um, each panelist is going to speak between about 10 and 15 minutes. Uh, we're going to save Q&As for uh, after the, all panelists get to, to talk. Uh, and what I'm going to do is before each panelist, I'm also going to provide a quick bio uh, based on what you see in your book. So if I go through it quickly, uh, please refer to page nine of the program so you can get uh, the, the slower reading version of it. Uh, and our first panelist today is actually going to be Dan Green. Uh, Dan is the senior analyst with uh, the uh, Navy Space and uh, Warfare Systems Center uh, based out of San Diego. <coughs> Uh, he's serving on the SECNAV Naval Innovation Advisory Council. Since his retirement from the Navy, he served as a member of the Secretary of the Navy's Innovation Task Force, director of the Joint Advanced Manufacturing Region, co-founded the Navy Data Sciences Team, and was the Department of Defense Technical Director for the University Corps Interagency Information Sharing Initiative from 2007 to 2009. Uh, Mr. Green is currently assigned to the San Diego Supercomputer Center as a research fellow where he is analyzing the implications of the fourth industrial revolution on U.S. economic security and maritime industrial preparedness. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dan. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, thanks, everyone. What a great crowd. We got here a little early and uh, uh, there was uh, no one at the table, so I wasn't sure who was going to show up today. Uh, but I'd like to thank uh, Libby and uh, especially uh, Deepak for in, uh, inviting me back. We met at Lawrence Livermore last year and uh, a couple other folks, uh, uh, Jim and Chris from CMTC, where are you back there? And uh, there are colleagues from the uh, local MEP in Southern California have been great uh, colleagues for us, for the Navy and for the uh, joint community that we represent uh, from a manufacturing perspective. So let me, what I'd like to do is uh, uh, a couple things, and, uh, and uh, Daniel said he, he'd nudge me if I went over, and I don't think I will, but I want to put uh, some things into context for where we are, not uh, so much in numbers, but sort of in a cultural perspective. And then what is the realm of the possibility as we move, as we move forward? Um, so uh, let me, ha I have my notes and all kinds of things that folks were talking about. First, uh, to this uh, Secretary, uh, uh, Secretary Williams, if he's still here, it's a great honor to be uh, uh, here with, uh, with uh, the uh, members of the, of the Cabinet, and, uh, and that shows uh, some commitment there uh, besides just, uh, the, just the stand up of the NMC uh, National Manufacturing Institutes. So uh, I have five points, then I'm going to show two videos, very short, they're a total of about five minutes, and I think you'll, they're, they're pretty pretty interesting videos, and then, uh, uh, and then I'll turn it over to Brad. 
So uh, last Wednesday, I was at uh, Camp David, and uh, I'm a nobody. I'm junior to all these guys here, and, and uh, just a regular engineer who's worked his way up through the Department of Defense, Department of the Navy, and Department of Defense. But I was invited back to Camp David with 83 other senior techni technical folks uh, across the uh, federal government. And we were hosted by Megan Smith, who's the Chief Technology Officer of the United States. And all the other folks had titles like CIO and Chief Data Officer and CTO and all kinds of directors of this and directors of that. And, and I didn't really realize why I was invited after being there. It was a great honor for me, as you might expect, um, being there. Uh, but I noticed three things. First, uh, these people were um, very nice to each other. I'm not used to that in the Department of Defense, right? We're, <laughs> you come in in the federal government, you, you see it on TV, you see people hollering at each other and screaming, and, and no, these people were very mission-oriented, and the DOD were mission-oriented. Every agency, every organization, every person I met was very mission-focused, but they were nice to each other and trying to come together, and this was an attempt by the technical community to do just, just what uh, Secretary Williams said. We are the continuity as the administration turns over. We have to make the, set up the next, uh, the agenda for the next administration and tell them what's important during the transition. It was really a cool uh, thing to be uh, part of and we're gonna be working together over the next couple uh, months to do that. The second thing I noticed was uh, all these people were um, a lot uh, uh, younger than me. Right, so I work up, I see all this, uh, you know, the baby boomers and all that stuff, and, and uh, so I'm looking around, there are a lot of people, most, in fact, I was one of the oldest people there, and there's uh, somebody else from DOD that beat me, but uh, here. And uh, they were a lot smarter than me. So a lot of PhDs, uh, you know, I'm well educated, and Navy did a good job on educating me, but, you know, you can sit down, and in two minutes you can tell who's the, who's the brains of the, of the person in the conversation, it's usually not me. So, and, and uh, uh, so uh, I'm, I'd like to discuss, maybe not during this panel, but sometime on this skills gap uh, concept, right? So I could left there, I could leave the government. I think I've done a pretty good job over the last 38 years, but there's not gonna be a skills gap when I leave. There's a whole bunch of people lined up right behind me to take over, and I think that sometimes we might be a little bit self-absorbed or arrogant about the, uh, about the skills gap coming up. And, and I think that uh, next time, Deepak, we're gonna have, we're gonna combine the space camp with the uh, uh, AMSOCAL meeting <laughs> and just see what kind of skills these young people actually have and maybe grow the skills uh, in the context of the 21st century rather than the 20th. Okay, so this panel uh, uh, here, this, this building here is beautiful. I, I didn't even know this place existed, this whole compound. And it's, a, it's a, um, an armory. Uh, it was built as an armory in 1913, 1914. So 100 years ago, it was built, and it's a plaque out there. I didn't uh, do the research. I just read it because I was here early. And it said we, they built these armories in the United States because in 1877, there was a huge amount of uh, civil uh, disturbance and a national railroad strike and they were burning down cities and all kinds of crazy stuff that we haven't seen since since the uh, civil rights movement really uh, here. So in 1877 was a lot of uh, discord in the country and they and the federal government built armories in all the towns to 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 as a as a uh, message to the populace that might try to rise up, you know, it was just after the civil war, so that it might try to rise up against the federal government. Well, the armory is now a museum. We're here in some beautiful place, and the Army's now a museum. So from a DOD perspective and from an international perspective, we have to sort of project ourselves forward and say, what is the, the arsenal of democracy? What does our armory look like today? And are we going to be this, not the most powerful country on Earth, and the, the one with the, the global force for good, if you use Navy terms, but what are we gonna look like in 100 years? And then what's in play here is the actual, our actual position uh, in the international community. That's why you're important. That's why we got together last week to discuss with the 83 technical people things like this, things like SoCal. What came out of it, SoCal, uh, AMP SoCal. What came out of it last week is this. The federal technical people, a lot of them weren't from the government. They had been in two years, three years, they're being pulled in from uh, Silicon Valley, they're being pulled in from all these kind of places to reinvigorate what, what 
uh, civil service means, what public service means. And they're pulling them in, and they're teaching all the old guys a lot of things, right? And they're teaching the, the old, old dogs new tricks, or the old dogs are just being pushed to the side and allowed to, uh, allowed to do what old dogs do. Um, so um, I think many of us now are looking, are trying to reflect on, on our past experiences, right? What did we do? How did we come up? Here's what I, how I got trained. Here's what the manufacturing means to me. Here's what I need to make sure somebody knows before I, uh, you know, I uh, kick the bucket. Uh, all those kinds of things. Um, and so we're reflecting on maybe a different time and a different set of circumstances and, and a different culture that exists today. And I think that we, we should, we should uh, take the time to sort of uh, exchange uh, some ideas with uh, people that, that maybe we do, don't, normally don't talk to. So the manufacturing, manufacturing itself is not a thing. It's a process, right? And what's happened across the board, across all of the, in the 21st century, is that we have a convergence of multiple technologies that have created this, this creative disruption. I like that Deepak talked about, uh, that, they, that it's created new industries. They, we use the same terms for them, but they don't look the same. So when I go in, and I'm the industrial preparedness uh, uh, lead right now, that's what I'm doing this fellowship on, is create an, a, a, a measure of what does industrial preparedness mean in the 21st century, and how do we ensure that the industrial base, not the defense industrial base, the industrial base itself, how do we go from sores to plowshares to sores to plowshares to plowshares to sores, or both at the same time? That's what the challenge is uh, right now. So the people that are in the defense industrial base may not even know it because it's a value chain. The manufacturing value chain is not a supply chain from a product development perspective. It's a value chain where your colleague that is going to make you successful, and I like the comments down here by uh, uh, Keith, I think, you know, where do I find help in my supply chain? And I, do I go to Northrop Grumman, or do I help the organizations that are here develop a new company that is actually providing manufacturing as a service to support somebody like you? Right? How do we do that? We are creating a demand. You stated a need. You stated a need for a new company, not for Northrop Grumman. You started, stated a need for people and organizations that actually can come together in a new way to support you better at your price point and support you as a, as a customer. Okay? Um, the third thing, I just have five things, and I'm going to promise I'll show the videos because they're really cool. Okay. We're surrounded by um, uh, uh, technology. Uh, right now. So technology, it, it's from a, if you, I've, I've been an advanced technology lead for the Navy for quite a number of years now. So I get this technology, it's mind-blowing stuff. I was working in LIDAR 15 years ago and hyperspectral sensors and all these kinds of things that Northrop Grumman is putting on, on, uh, on planes and in lots of other uh, places. But this, this technology, now there is no comparative advantage to the technology itself. It's globalized. It's not just a globalized supply chain. It's not that. It's that the technology itself is globalized. Therefore, the only way that we can get comparative advantage and competitive advantage is in the value-adding processes and in the, in the adoption of that technology in a new way, or more importantly, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, a most appropriate time. So lead systems integration, OEMs and supply chain and all that kind of stuff. Well, where are the lead systems integration? DOD moved away from being an LSI many years ago. In fact, we, we, we destroyed that concept within the Department of Defense. That has to come back. We have to be LSI because we're not big enough to be your prime customer anymore for your big companies. We want you to be exporters. We want you to make profits. But we have to be a catalyst for change. The DOD has a lot of smart guys on really, really hard problem sets. And so that if you can solve our problems, if you can solve a DOD problem, or a DOE problem, or a DOJ problem, or a, D, uh, a, a Department of Agriculture problem, wow, you have something that's probably com has comparative advantage, right? So we can be a catalyst for change. We can help you to define the problem sets where if you define, help define that uh, support uh, uh, and, and solve that problem, you have a comparative advantage against people with, with that are those problem sets that are subsets to what you find at the federal government. In, in uh, military intelligence, we have this concept called mirror imaging. And mirror imaging is when you look at the competition 
and you look at your enemy, or you look at your peer competitor, and you think, and you say, ah, they, they are going to respond to this challenge or this opportunity the same way I do, right? So you, you've trained, you're a fighter pilot, and they have, you have an F-18, and they have a, a, a J-8, and you're going back, and you think that the Chinese pilot actually thinks the way you do. So mirror imaging is a bias that is very, very dangerous. So the, this mirror imaging concept that we have, these mental models that we have about what manufacturing is, if we're mirror imaging uh, the, the, our competitors in China and in the whole Asian area, the ASEAN 15 countries, uh, Mr. Williams talked about the uh, TTP, the trans trans or TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, but we, we didn't talk about was ASEAN. Right, so ASEAN is all the other guys getting together. They're going to try to kick our butts on trade uh, in the South uh, Asian, in, in 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 Asia, where most of the people live. Right, so that's a, the other aspect of this. And finally, our 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 competitive, being competitive, uh, and who is the who is our peer competitor now? We in DoD we talk about not having a peer competitor in 1992, and taking the the uh, uh, the peace dividend and. We spent that over and over and over again, believe me, uh, spent that peace dividend for 20 years and now we're in a little bit of a, uh, a, 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 a time when we have to review that. But our real, we're really in competition with time. Our, we have to compete and we have to adopt technology and we have to create product lines and services more rapidly because the technology life cycles themselves are so short, so the comparative advantage of the technology, its life cycle is shorter than the product life cycle that manufacturing is creating in many, in many cases. So in order to be competitive, we have to be competitive in time. So that's the, the, uh, the fifth thing. So I'll have, I'll have three things uh, to, to finish up with uh, after I show my videos, but I want to point out my crew. I'm a Navy guy, so I have to have a crew. Um, and so um, I have uh, two people that are my colleagues and good friends that I brought up uh, from San Diego with me today, and you'll see them uh, here around here, and I, ex I expect you to um, uh, welcome them to uh, USC, even though we're the real Southern California. I'm 15 miles north of the Mexican border and about 65 miles south of here, so um, uh, here. So the first is uh, Dr. Kristen Holdsworth. If Kristen, would you stand up a minute? Stand, please. She doesn't have to take orders from me. <laughs> So one thing is, so, so Kristen is the one that, that she, I get reverse mentoring from Kristen. She was a professor at University of, Southern Cal, uh, University of Southern California. She was not a professor here. She was at UCSD for about uh, nine years. She's a material scientist. I brought her onto my team uh, about a year ago. She was a brand new professional in the, in the government. She has one year of experience and uh, she trumps my 38 years of, of experience in, in that one time. So that's what I'm, I'm talking from from a lesson learned here about the, the younger generation coming up and being able to take over for, uh, for you with no, uh, uh, no loss. So as you'll see her on the, on the video here in a minute. Uh, she is the director of the Joint Advanced Manufacturing Region, which, which is sort of our parallel to uh, AMP SoCal, and we'll be partnering. This is why uh, Jim and Chris wanted us to, to come up here in the first place, was to partner the Joint Advanced Manufacturing Region, which is our attempt to reach across all of the services and to make sure that we're out using our, our funds uh, collectively to, uh, to be that catalyst for uh, some of these uh, emerging technologies and make sure we understand what we need from manufacturing so that we can put good RFPs out so that we're, we're not, uh, 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 you know, you guys respond to what we need or what we say, not what we need. <laughs> you, the RFP comes out, if we don't have the right uh, terminology in there, we don't understand the technology enough, you cannot respond to us. So Kristen is working that, uh, and she was invited to the White House as a, um, a speaker here about in June, uh, and she kicked off the, uh, uh, that meeting in the White House, and she has great relationship with, uh, with uh, uh, Megan Smith's group and Tom Khalil, who's the director, direct, deputy director for manufacturing. Uh, and you can please talk to her, she's a great person. And the second one is Dan Hendricks. Dan, where are you? Dan Hendricks is a small business owner. He's a colleague of mine, Navy veteran, uh, nuclear power veteran. He started under Admiral Rickover, like me, uh, many years ago. 
And, uh, and he has an open source maker lab. So uh, somebody said, uh, I think Brad, you asked, you said, where's Joe the, Joe the machinist? Where's Joe the machinist shop? Well, that's Dan uh, right, right there. So what's different here, you've heard about maker labs, make, uh, uh, these uh, building, uh, allowing people to come back and learn what a screwdriver is. And you'd be amazed if you go <coughs> talk to Dan or you talk to the maker movement, how your young people respond to actual physical stimulation, the mental physical stimulation that we used to get from shop, right? That's what it, really what a maker space is. It's taking new technologies, but old concepts of the, of the, uh, of, of the mind and the, and the manual integration, and they are responding incredibly well. So I am not so concerned about the skills gap that ap appears to be there when we start to pull the string uh, uh, back on that. So uh, Dan, Dan has some cards. Kristen and I don't have cards, but please talk to him about, uh, he's in northern, north, northern San Diego County and his makerspace, and he's working with us. He's also been called back to the White House and is in charge of Maker as Mentor for uh, Mr. Khalil. And I think uh, we have 100, right? We have a goal of 100, and there's supposed to be 100 people here. So please sign up. If you think uh, that you're one of the guys that knows more about manufacturing than, than the guy sitting next to you, please sign up with Maker the Manufacturer. This is how we share um, uh, the, the, ma the manufacturing expertise, sponsored by the White House, share uh, the uh, and link up the manufacturer with the new uh, startups. And we do so with these uh, test beds that we're, uh, that we're uh, uh, creating. Okay, so that's my points. I'll have three uh, wrap-up points. And uh, Robert? Hi, I'm Dr. Kristen Holsworth. I'm the director of JAMR, the Joint Advanced Manufacturing Region, and I joined SPAWAR one year ago today. My name is Andrew Bonica, and I'm the Chief Technology Officer for the JAMR program. I came on to the JAMR program by way of Dan Green, who had started this effort um, as part of the Secretary of the Navy's Innovation Task Force. Secretary Mabus said that he wanted the Navy to be more innovative so we could respond quickly to the needs of the fleet. And then it was in September of 2015 that the Additive Manufacturing Tasking Memo came out. And it was under that that five goals were developed. And that's really where Spaywar took the lead for goal number four. And X-Man was created as the first node in that smart manufacturing grid. We've been working together on the X-Man, the Expeditionary Manufacturing Mobile Test Bed. And it's been a joint effort with the Marines up at Camp Pendleton. It's allowed us to bring to the fleet the tools and technologies that we use here um, in the depot side of the house so that way the Marines will be able to either fabricate or um, capture the requirements for their solutions that they need immediately. There was a, a bracket for an amphibious assault vehicle that would break and would ultimately lead to that vehicle being at a commission for on average 200 days. And with the technologies that were available within the X-Men, they fortified that design and were able to print a prototype and ultimately then send it over to their mills to create a uh, the bracket that they needed and they were able to do that in one day so they improved their readiness by 199 days. It really puts a lot of capability uh, into their hands for rapid prototyping and allows us as engineers back at the depot to be able to understand the requirements immediately that the Marines need. This X-Man shelter incorporates more than just 3D printing or additive manufacturing, but also advanced subtractive manufacturing. Uh, we have 3D laser scanners, so there's really a lot of technology packed into this small expeditionary mobile container. Right, in addition to the networking aspect, so that there's a reach-back capability. The Commandant of the Marine Corps was beyond impressed and literally told us this is going to change everything. What additive manufacturing has done for us as engineers is be able to open up our minds to limitless, virtual limitless design possibilities. And it's about much more than parts and components. It's really about the paradigm shift. This, this is about changing the way people think.
Ignite our arms. Ready? Yes. Countdown in 10, Ten nine, nine, eight, eight seven, five, six, five, five four, four smoke. three, five, two, two, one, one launch. <laughs> Talk about micro manufacturing. Okay, so we talk about manufacturing, big boys, all the OEMs, and all that kind of stuff. But the real uh, agility and and the real uh, rapid on ramping up technology is going to come from these micro manufacturers. This is uh, not maker spaces. These are professional uh, things. This is what Dan is trying to do uh, down in uh, uh, San Diego um, to create this manufacturing entity. They look a lot like. Um, small businesses up in Silicon Valley. Um, I will talk about the no-collar worker. So in manufacturing in the past, we had labor, and we had unions, and we had uh, white collar and blue collar and all these distinctions, which I think a lot of that still uh, work around. But because of ITOT convergence, information technology and operational technology, that really uh, is, uh, defines the, new, the factory of the 21st century, you have a concept of, of no-collar. So if I go up to Silicon Valley, I wouldn't wear this jacket. I wouldn't wear this shirt. I have my, my jammer. I'm going to show my jammer shirt. Right? So I got my, my jammer t-shirt on. I'm going to wear my, I'm going to go up there with no collar. I'm going to sit down with some really, really smart people. And if people come in with jackets on, they have a saying up there, right? The guy that comes in for the jacket is going to take credit for the hard work that you're doing. So they don't like people with, uh, with jackets. They have hoodies when it's cold and t-shirts when it's cold. And then the final thing is, um, is the concept of test beds. So last year, when we started Jammer, people wanted to have, they wanted to say, well, what are you going to do? Dan, what are you doing for me today? <coughs> right, this was uh, industry. And the, w the thing that we've defined over the last year is that we're working with uh, some big OEMs and some really uh, small guys like startups like uh, Dan and the Supercomputer Center. And we've established five test beds. So that if you have something that you want to test, there's a, a way to uh, on-ramp some of your stuff. And so that you can determine uh, if there's a use for it, and then we can determine uh, how it fits into the manufacturing ecosystem that's evolving. How are we doing? Okay? No? Okay. Keep working on it. We'll come back to it. Okay? Thank you. So with that, I think we're going to move on to Brad. Uh, Brad, I'm going <coughs> to pass you the, the clicker. Uh, for the PowerPoint, but uh, just briefly, Brad Botwin is responsible for developing surveys and analyses and implementing programs designed to ensure a technologically superior and competitive defense industrial base compatible of meeting U.S. economic and national security requirements. Mr. Botwin's programmatic responsibilities include assessment of U.S. industrial capabilities and critical technologies, Section 232 investigations of the effect of imports on national security, foreign availability assessments, and short supply determinations. Mr. Botwin has a degree in international affairs and economics from the American University and an MBA from George Washington University with a concentration in international business and finance. So even though I'm on a defense panel, uh, let me remind everyone the Commerce Department is not part of the Defense Department. I know Dan likes to think that sometimes. We do a lot of work together, but we are a separate uh, agency. Um, I also want to thank uh, Assistant Secretary Williams. So I, I'm a career employee, not a, a, a political appointee. So I've been with Commerce uh, 32 years. I have to say that was the best EDA presentation I have ever heard it, it, from the department. So I, I thank you. And it's unfortunate that we met here today and it's almost over. Uh, but uh, very important activities uh, that EDA does to, to facilitate things happening in, in OEA also, uh, the sister organization uh, in the Defense Department. Uh, let me introduce uh, my crew, uh, Erica Maynard. She won't stand up, though. Uh, but um, 
I'm going to go into, Dan asked me to talk about how's the industrial base, how, how the whole industrial base. So what I thought I'd do is kind of pick and choose from the different studies, uh, surveys we do, and, uh, and go around. I am not as uh, optimistic as my colleague Dan here, uh, because I think uh, the DOD world always is very narrow, where we try to take a broader look at the, the one industrial base. There is one industrial base. Uh, but we, we see things happening, uh, and I really uh, align very much with uh, what Kevin Mitchell from Northrop Grumman presented today. Uh, I thought I was going to be some of the bad news uh, in uh, California, even nationwide, but uh, Kevin really laid it out uh, in some great detail. Um, just real quick. So uh, my bureau in commerce is the smallest bureau, uh, focuses primarily on export controls and licensing. So if you try to ship stuff to the bad guys out there, uh, we'll uh, either not give you a license or if you do it anyway, we'll come get you with our enforcement arm. Um, we have a very small group uh, which entails uh, doing defense industrial base assessments. Uh, we work with the Defense Production Act of 1950. Defense Production Act, where the rest of the Bureau works with the Export Administration Act. And my customer base is actually very different. It's not really the department, per se, but it's other agencies around the government. Uh, and we look at things uh, using this mandatory authority, uh, employment, financials, even for uh, privately held. So my surveys are mandatory go to jail. Uh, if you don't fill them out. So we are the silver bullet of the data collection world. Uh, and many of the primes here in the room today and probably some of the subs have seen either my name or uh, the, the BIS, the Bureau, uh, in, in getting these surveys on the health and competitiveness of the industrial base. And to the uh, Price Waterhouse sponsors, yes, you have fancier covers, but I have better data. <laughs> Okay, Keep so uh, really our core mission is to, is to benchmark where either sector stand or technology stand, um, <coughs> monitor trends that are going on. We try to raise the awareness of the diminishing manufacturing uh, and, and really bring the bad news to my customer, be it the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, uh, NASA, intelligence community, OEA, uh, so, uh, and Congress, uh, we get uh, some taskings I'll mention uh, from Congress. Uh, what have we done in the past few years? Um, well, right now I'm doing some work with uh, OEA on the C-17 facility that's been raised a number of times today. Uh, first thing we did uh, is we jumped in and uh, I wanna thank the Boeing people in the room. Uh, we took some of the excess equipment in that facility and it has been transferred to 23 high schools and community colleges in Southern California. So Boeing stepped up. Uh, Boeing stepped up to the plate. Unfortunately, uh, my colleagues at the U.S. Air Force uh, have not to date done anything to help in this process. So I just had to say that. Um, I'm doing a study right now on textiles, apparel, and footwear. Actually, some of it's very high tech, and visited a couple of facilities here in Los Angeles yesterday. Uh, some of the themes that Kevin talked about in the defense sector, same thing. Where is the city of Los Angeles, where is the state of California helping these manufacturers who, some of them do defense work. So uniforms have to be made in the United States. The boots, uh, a lot of the textiles and apparel that the services use have to be made here. No assistance from the state. So we're the first government people to actually show up other than OSHA or EPA to harass them. Uh, so uh, things are not great in the industrial base. Um, other study we're doing, and I'm going to mention this, uh, the top one, we are looking uh, with the Defense Department at every facility that has a classified contract. So there are 13,000 facilities across the country that have classified contracts with DOD. And we're doing some work can't get into what we're doing, but we are surveying them and putting this together. But we've asked other questions uh, as we are getting the, the key info for the Defense Security Service, and, and let me go into some of that. Uh, this is from, so I have, of those 13,000, we just, uh, we about a year and a half into this, we have uh, 2,000 surveys back, 
And we asked the companies, what are their top challenges? Now, these people with classified contracts, this can be from explosives to literally dog trainers. I haven't seen that survey yet. I'm waiting to see that one. But everything in between. So it can be uh, making missile parts, uh, you name it, anything that is classified for DOD. If you look at the top uh, seven challenges, uh, we, we are the top five, the government. Acquisition process, the health care, the uh, purchasing volatility, regulatory burden. So we need to do a better job as a government in setting the table. These are people that are dedicating themselves to doing defense work and classified defense work, and yet the problem is not really competition per se or other things. It's, it's how we do business, how we deal with these companies. So I feel like we, we're in Washington too much and not going out in the field and actually talking to these people. And this is held up now through 2,000 surveys. We will have this through 13,000 surveys. Again, these are all defense contractors already. Now let me flip to another study we did. This was a, a, a large study, 3,700 companies looking at the U.S. space industrial base. So we again went from the Boeings and the Lockheeds all the way down to about five tiers. Uh, critical suppliers, not every supplier, but critical suppliers. On the left, again, we asked top 10 challenges. Okay, it's the standard things, competition, labor costs, budget cuts. At the, in the space sector, uh, Uncle Sam, particularly on the defense and intelligence side, is the 800-pound gorilla. Okay, so they are at commercial space and NASA very small right now. Um, so we look at the problems. Well, we then sorted the data on the right side, the top being the big guys, the, the Boeings and Lockheeds. They have a different set of problems than the smaller companies, which is the data below. So yeah, competition, export controls, which Commerce does and the State Department and DOD uh, control, those are their problems, really doing the business out there. For the small guys, Healthcare, taxes, labor costs, you know, I say making payroll every week. Those are the key problems. How do I get these innovative ideas from my company into either the prime and or the service that I'm trying to sell to, the National Reconnaissance Office, Air Force? There's no mechanism. You ever try to find the government? You couldn't find me on the website, Dan, right? You can't find each other, okay? So we're not, we're not doing a good job in helping the small companies get information on who we are and what we can do. And then the barriers to entry on the commercial side. I mean, it, this, in space, this is a unique problem. It's, it's just beginning to grow. But we're now, uh, I, I would say, battling the Air Force again, my friends at the Air Force, who have surplus ICBM motors from 30 <coughs> years ago that they want to put on the market. And we asked them, have you, what is this going to do to SpaceX and others? You just want to unload these on the marketplace that are, they're, because you don't want to demill them. Well, they're going to make five cents on the dollar. That's good for the Air Force, not good for the industrial base. So they're not looking at the bigger picture. And we were trying to bring as a department working with NASA, trying to show them that there's a bigger world and you're going to stifle innovation by dumping old equipment out there. OK? You don't need to do that. In the space sector, um, as you would with your own personal investments, you wouldn't put everything into, you know, hopefully you don't put it all your, uh, I always say the thrift savings plan for the government. You don't put it all in the high tech electronics sector. You need to balance your investments, short term, long term, because you don't know where the market's going. And I say in Southern California, you can't be in the movie business and the artsy business all the time. You need to have a mix of businesses. You have that here. You have that here, but you need to promote all of them. We found in the space study that only half the companies said they were space companies of those 3,700. The other ones, they do aircraft, they do energy work. On the far right, they do healthcare. One industrial base doing all this. So they will make a part for the National Reconnaissance Office, but they're also doing some healthcare parts too because they got to live and they can't wait for NRO every five year cycle to come back and give me that one exotic thing that I need. Okay? They're not going to sit around and wait. Okay, so we are pushing from a commerce perspective. If you want to do defense work, you better have your fingers in lots of other things also because we just don't know where it's going and how long it's going to be there for you. So electronics, shipbuilding, again, 
Um, I, I go back to my Boeing friends. They like that sweet spot of 25%. We use that also with dependency on companies. You have more than 25% in you know, the Boeing world in their systems, that's it. They, they top you out because they, in case something happens on their side, they don't want you to disappear. They don't want you to disappear as a supplier. So same thing with your investments. You want to be all over the place because you need to survive in a very rapidly changing environment. So composites. We surveyed the composite industry uh, for the Defense Logistics Agency. 98 respondents. On the right, light blue, yeah, we're getting into things. On the left side, the red, the different areas of the defense sector that these companies are getting out of. They're getting out of. Okay, there's a lot of volatility on the defense side uh, for you know, a good chunk of the companies. We look at this, same thing now, commercial, commercial composites. Okay, it could be some of the same companies doing both defense and commercial work. Fixed wing, God bless Boeing, you know, cranking out those airplanes. Very little dropout except in one company, we had one or two companies in the energy sector. So the, again, these companies are diversifying themselves. A larger number of firms here are in the commercial side of composites. Okay, you're only gonna make so many joint strike fighters, only gonna make that exotic new plane of Northrop Grumman. How many are you actually gonna build? How many can we afford? 100? Maybe? 50? Certainly not going to replace the C-17 that we lost here in Southern California. Okay? Not going to volume-wise for small businesses. And is it going to be worth your time to make 100 nuts, bolts, and screws for that airplane? I don't know. We'll see. We'll see as this comes up. All right. Bigger picture. Let's go back to space now. Keep jumping around here. Make you dizzy. 3,700 companies. The red because there's a lack of systems in the space sector, and again, this is the 800-pound gorilla DOD intelligence community, all the red is, and the primes have told me this is right on the nose, I'm already not getting R&D money from the government, and I'm not getting design and engineering funding anymore. So this is a net change. So from this period, of, this goes up through 2014, I'm getting rid of those people. I'm losing those people on my staff because there's no work for them. And commercial space hasn't picked up enough to actually get into it. If I did this today, that red would be all the way over. All the way over. Because I'm done. The systems have gone through the process. I've designed them. I've manufactured them. I've tested them. It's, getting, it's not getting better in the space sector. So it's going to shrink on the government side. Will the commercial come up? If I can stop these guys from selling ICBMs, maybe at the Air Force, maybe it'll come up. Okay, so there is going to be problems in the defense sector, space sector. Hiring, this is another butte. 98 companies, and I go back to my composite study. These companies, by the way, are all over the country, so not just in California. The problems, uh, scientists, engineers, production line workers, it's the location, can't get people. Again, Northrop Grumman said that, can't get them to move here. The skills, they're coming out of the schools without the skill sets. You have to set up your own school. Amazing, you have to set up your own school to train the people. Competition and turnover. They want to go work for somebody else, like Google or somebody, okay? So this is happening. So we are losing manufacturing, hands-on manufacturing, to these touchy-feely Google and other things. Even semiconductors, very few employees doing semiconductor work. For the defense sector, you need those airplanes that are 25 years old, 30 years old, and your ships and everything else. You have to actually touch those things and build them and maintain them. Let me take this on a grand scale again. Roller coaster here. This is for the 3,700 space companies. We asked them, are you having a hard time and do you have vacancies? And they told us, yeah, I got almost 25,000 vacancies when we did that survey. This was only 33% of the companies told us they had vacancies. Where? Engineering, production line workers, test operators. Okay? Not everyone is going to be a rocket scientist. We spend a lot of time on the rocket scientist engineer. My dad's a rocket scientist. I am not. Skipped. <laughs> but uh, these are high school kids, these are community college students. What are we doing? And if you look at the, at the pie chart, 22% of these jobs were in California, those 25,000 openings. They can't find a machinist. 
they can't find kids in high school that want to actually push buttons and make a part. So we're spending time again, this is a nice crowd here, engineers, scientists, who's working, where is the high school people in here? I saw one high school on the Northrop Grumman thing, is it Hawthorne High School, I guess that was? If the companies, if you have to, as a small company, go work with a high school, then the system is not working. You don't have time. You have to make payroll this week. You have to sell your parts this week. So the school system is not set up anymore to do, it's not even dirty anymore. You touch the buttons. You have to know a little math. So this, this is a problem. So the skill sets, uh, all, all these other things, we are, we are missing the boat on what is going on and what the companies need. We're not talking to the companies enough. All right, let me, some of these, it's a little more detailed, but the, the, the theme of the next two slides, this is uncertainty with the government, the variability of demand. The companies that said they have more, 25% or more of their business with the government, they have a, less of a desire to continue to work with the government. They are tired of working with the government. We need to do a better job in enticing companies to want to work with the government. And that, again, the Northrop's, the Boeing's, these guys will be there till the end of the earth, okay? It's the other companies below them in the supply chain. Same thing on the acquisition process. You've got 100 guys at Northrop that can read those regulations. You don't have 100 guys in the small companies to do this. You, that you're asking, I, I thought that was the best question today. You're asking Northrop Grumman, can you set up a team to help me with the crazy environmental rules here in California? If they did that for you, and then there are so many other issues that would come up, you wouldn't be in the, the Northrop Grumman wouldn't be in the business anymore. They'd be helping, they'd be effectively what we're supposed to be doing, the government. Assisting companies get the, the business out there. So there's not enough info on this slide, the four things, and you'll get a set of these. Uh, not enough info for the small companies on how to bid. The process of bidding as a small company, you'll go broke bidding and you'll never win. And if I'm doing things the Northrop Grumman way this way, Boeing does it this way. Lockheed Martin does it this way. How can you as a small business stay a part of each team? You can't. You can't. Okay, so it's really a lot of pressure on the small and medium-sized companies. Last slide. There is a lot of off-the-shelf programs that can assist companies, small, medium, even the large. Um, so I have the three uh, studies here. So this, the space deep dive study, the 3,700 respondents, the materials we actually surveyed, 269 companies, and this critical facilities, the classified facilities. These are the percentages of the companies, for example, in cyber, we only started asking that recently, 26% of these defense facilities that, that do defense work want help from the FBI and others on cyber security. That is frightening to me. There are nuclear companies in here, okay? So we are trying to get, in, we actually are in touch with the FBI right now. We are trying to do better outreach. Uh, but how to expand uh, your markets, uh, I heard SBIR, STTR today, how to export. These are off the shelf things. You shouldn't have to go to the prime contractor to ask for this. It's other government agencies. Okay? We're not doing our job in getting the info out to you. And that's it. Thank you very much, Brad. <clears throat> I'm going to intervene for a second just to provide a little context and just to say I think that what's interesting between, about the first and the second presenter here is, first of all, the context. That, there are many challenges that are systemic to the U.S. and the defense industrial base that make competition difficult both for small and medium-sized uh, uh, firms, but also for the large primes. Um, there are efforts that the Department of Defense undertakes, um, many examples by Dan, uh, to try and uh, address some of those challenges, both by DOD messaging what some of its challenges are from the research and development uh, perspective, but also uh, with regard to some of the things that it knows about uh, producing some of the, the goods that it needs to be successful maintaining national defense. Those are some of the direct efforts. And what Mike is going to talk about now are some of the indirect efforts or less direct efforts that DOD takes also to provide assistance to uh, the U.S. industrial base. Uh, Mike Gilroy is OEA's program director for the Defense Industry Adjustment Program. 
Uh, he provides policy direction and also directly manages several projects. Prior to joining OEA, Mike served as the National Base Realignment and Closure Coordinator for the Department of Labor's Employment and Training Administration. During that time, he developed policies and approaches to address workforce development needs specific to defense communities impacted by the 2005 BRAC round and managed the BRAC response activities of the Employment and Training Administration's six regional offices. He is a U.S. Army combat veteran, hua. He holds a master's degree in public administration from the University of Oklahoma and in national security and strate strategy from the U.S. Naval War College. Mike? Okay, my name is uh, Mike Gilroy, as Dan mentioned, I'm the Program Director for Defense Industry Adjustment at the Office of Economic Adjustment, where, due to an unfortunate coincidence between my job title and my hairstyle, I am known as Daddy Warbucks. So you will, <laughs> now that you will never forget me, I may say something uh, in this briefing that will cause you to say, hey, I want some more information on that. So uh, go to our website, oea.gov. There's the main line number, call the main line, say, hey, I need to talk to Daddy Warbucks, and they'll put you right through. Uh, I, am a, uh, I am a Boston kid, so I talk really fast, so I'll probably get you back on track. Um, although I'm a Boston kid, uh, two weeks ago I became a Californian. Prior to that, I was a Californian only by marriage, but uh, my wife and I recently moved uh, just north of Sacramento. She's a UCLA grad, so apologies to USC, but I'll be rooting for the Bruins this year. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, my program because we are, um, we are where the rubber meets the road. I heard nothing in this room today from Assistant Secretary Williams' pitch all the way to Brad's that we haven't already heard on the, at the user level uh, in, in my job. And our job is to assist communities in responding to defense impacts. So a little bit about my office, then a micro uh, capsule about um, the program itself, and, and then I'll kind of talk a little bit about what we see on the ground. Uh, OEA has been around since 1961, and by one name or another, uh, then Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara was the former CEO of Ford Motor. He said, hey, closing a military base looks a lot like closing a uh, an auto plant, I'm familiar with that, maybe the department needs some kind of capability to respond to that. So um, when anyone knows of OEA and they've heard of us, they think of us as the BRAC guys, and we are the BRAC guys, we're the outside defense BRAC guys, whereas the services are the inside defense BRAC guys. So if you need a military base closed, we're your folks. Uh, but we have a couple other uh, business lines, one of which is um, my line, the Defense Industry Adjustment Program, where we respond to contract reductions, contract cancellations, failures to proceed, or, and we don't like to talk about this, in the case of some um, OEMs that just decide for business reasons, we're going to close this defense facility and move, we can help. And that happened uh, in, in 2010 in Wichita when Boeing said, we're going to pull all our military production out of Wichita, move it up to Oklahoma City. We're going to leave the commercial side behind. We went to Sedgwick County in the city of Wichita and said, hey, do you need any help? And they opted not to work with us, but they were surprised that we were authorized to do that under 10 U.S. Code, and we are. So if you have a question about whether or not you're eligible for assistance due to a defense program change, um, give us a call. There's a little form on our website you fill out and that starts the process. Now, um, I can only provide technical assistance and financial assistance to cities, uh, entities of government. So if the formal legal name of your agency or entity has city of, county of, town of, state of in it, you're eligible, probably. Uh, and if it doesn't, you're probably not. You'll notice that the University of Southern California is, doesn't have state of, city of, county of, town of in it. And yet, they have one of our grants. That's what funded AMP SoCal. Um, don't automatically rule yourself out. Let us rule you out. How did we get to Leonard and his crew? Uh, we said, hey, got any friends at the state? And we can fund the state, and the state served as a pass-through. So let us work with you. Our bias when, when working with communities is to find a way to say yes. If at the end of the journey we, try, we say no, it really means I, I just can't get there. But we're, we are here to assist communities. We're kind of unique in, in, the, uh, in the federal government in that when you work with us, you get a project manager 
cradle to grave, and that project manager will also help you navigate the, uh, the, the rest of the federal government with potential assistance programs. No one at OEA grew up there. Everybody came from somewhere else. So I came from the Department of Labor via the United States Army. Um, we have our, our Compliance and Integration Director came from the Philadelphia Regional Office of EDA until our, our recently retired Associate Director was the Public Works Director at EDA. We have folks who worked at EPA, HUD, HHS. So what, what, is, what does that mean to you if you're one of our grantees? It means that we still have the Rolodex back to our old agency. And we can call, and, and I have done this, I've called my old boss and say, hey, Eric, I, how come you haven't processed SoCal's uh, National Emergency Grant application yet? What's going on with that? So that's one of the unique things about OEA is that you get a project manager cradle to grave, and we really try to break down the silos. You, you've heard folks talk about that, you, Brad, most recently, about how to cut across federal government. The genesis of my program um, we, we always fund my program every year at about $12 million a year. Um, and if we, if we don't have takers on that, then, then the money goes back into the pot for a legacy BRAC community that might be facing environmental challenges or, or one of our other business lines. In 2012, uh, Gene Sperling at the National Economic Council called his friend, then Deputy Secretary of Defense Ash Carter, and said, come on over and talk to me because we're ending two wars and it, the drawdown in defense contracting is inevitable. Uh, you and I, Ash, did this in the, in the mid-90s with the Cold War drawdown. So uh, let's talk about what it takes to do it again. And, and you know, the, the White House would like to see a plan. Of course, everything in the military rolls downhill, and that ended up in my lap. And my colleague, Liz Kimianti, and I spent the better part of a year doing a PhD dissertation on defense industry adjustment. What did we do in the 70s, 60s, 50s? What did we do after World War II? What did it look like in the 90s? What was the payoff from that? Uh, what could we do today? Um, we came up with a proposal for DOD of 300 million over five years. Um, and um, I got the privilege of taking that through the Pentagon budget maw. Trust me, you never want to do that. And uh, I ended up with 192 million when I came out the other side. Uh, first year of the program was fiscal 14. I sunset in 18. Now, that big extra chunk of money sunsets in 18. We'll still have the program. We ju I just won't be as robustly funded. Um, so one of the problems we're seeing, and, and this is kind of where I segue into the what we're seeing on the ground thing, this is, provides some context. You can see that we're on a downward swing in defense contracting. Um, there's a lot of evidence out there that shows, hey, what DOD really needs in constant dollars to provide the level of defense it's committed to, uh, you know, due to treaties and other obligations and so on, is about $600 billion a year. That number stays relatively constant, goes up by 10 or $20 billion, but it's somewhere in that neighborhood. I worked in Army Program Analysis and Evaluation in 1994, and uh, I, was, uh, I was the Program Integration Team Lead Analyst. And uh, that number hasn't changed since 1994. So it's in, in inflation adjusted dollars, it runs about the same. Next year, fiscal 17, um, we're going to be about $20 million off of that mark. So, okay, DOD doesn't have as much money as it used to. You know, things happen. Here's what it means for you sitting in the room is we're $8 billion short on procurement. That's not too big of a hit all things being relative, but, and this is what you've heard over and over again, it's the constant whipsawing of the DOD budget that, that causes small to mid-sized defense manufacturers a, an inability to plan. And what we see on the ground is some manufacturers are just saying the heck with this because I cannot hang with when DOD doesn't have a relatively consistent process. I can't there's no way to keep my folks in business and busy unless I know what's coming down the pipeline. So uh, I'm getting away from DOD. That then has ripple effects on the wider local economy. And again, we, we're, we're really focused on local economies. We do state projects, but we're not generally focused on states. We're kind of an enabler for states. We enable states to do some planning that then rolls down and helps um, communities. 
we are focused more on uh, regional projects. That's kind of our, our, our bread and butter right there. Again, I don't fund anything. I fund communities, but communities then go out and provide programs that assist small to mid-sized manufacturers. Um, what are we doing? What are our grantees doing? The easy way to do this is go to oea.gov, find my program, Defense Industry Adjustment, and there you'll have a project, uh, somewhere in the links buried there, you'll have a project profile for every one of the projects I'm doing. So <laughs> nothing that our grantees are doing at the local level is really rocket science. It's their, their tried and true approaches. Um, but all of these grantees have varying degrees of success. Why? Well, at the risk of going all Barbara Streisand on you, people. People who need people are the luckiest people in the world. That is the missing link for why some projects run better than others. And so th there's a lot of um, econometric gloss behind this, but let me, and, and Dan's heard me give this pitch over and over again. Um, the, the way to figure out how best to energize a local project is to do a social network map. And so think of that as a supply chain for people. Because I'm not trying to figure out what capacity Acme Widget has. I'm trying to figure out what's in Joe Smith's head. What does he know? Who does he know? How does he connect to those people? How do I tap what's in his head? Leadership is ultimately the, um, the determining factor in why some projects work better than others. Even though everybody is doing some variant of these things, um, why, what we've seen over time is the real reason, the real determinant of why some work better than others is the, the, the more successful projects have correctly aligned their talent, their leadership talent, the people who are running the program to, to, to hit the sweet spot in the local economy. And there's no other way to put it. There's a methodology for finding those folks and making sure you get the right people in the right places, social network mapping. but. Um, those folks who have actually worked to do it find themselves getting out ahead of the curve a lot faster than everybody else. So what works? Uh, I mentioned leadership. That's really the issue. If, I, if you remember nothing else, it's um, getting the right person to lead the right subcommittee of your local project. So if you're a manufacturer, you're probably like, yeah, I'm, I'm three lengths removed from that. But odds are you know your local mayor, county administrator, you know economic development officials, you know people who are gonna bring this, these programs to you. I'll describe a couple of examples in a minute. Um, and so it's in your best interest to get that person in the right spot. Um, all tip, too typically when we go out into the field, what we get uh, when we show up for the initial meeting, you know, we've determined you're eligible for our assistance and we're there to find out how best to get you assistance, what you really need, what you need in year one, what I can put off until year two, because I have a limited amount of money too. Um, we get the usual suspects in the room. They're the same 15 people who've been doing the same thing for 40 years. I submit to you that you're in a fix because the same 15 people have been doing the same thing for the last 40 years. So it is, and even if they're the right people to be leading, and the reason why you're an economic hurt locker is because external circumstances, geography, railroad passing, whatever it is, it's worth it to go back and look at who ought to be in charge, who ought to be at the table. The bigger we're casting the net, the better off we are. You can look at the bottom there, my last bullet. That's why you want to do that, because folks at the manufacturing level who work in Acme Widget, a specialized titanium milling firm of only 15 people. They're the ones that are gonna tell you if what your local MEP is proposing as part of this project is gonna work or not. And the more of those folks you get around the table, sure, you run, you run a risk of having eight-hour meetings where we all throw stones at each other, but that's how your process gets refined. The folks, so I mentioned leadership's the key, but I also mentioned that organization is the key. The, the folks that we've had, the grantees we've had up to this point have flailed for a little bit, have flailed because they didn't do this kind of stuff. They didn't talk to CEOs. They didn't talk to community college presidents or workforce development professionals at the local level. 
Um, they didn't find out, they didn't go study all the studies that were already out there to find out the approaches that were already tried and didn't work. The more you organize, if you take that nine months to organize a project and you get the right people in charge, then you implement all the other stuff you're already doing, tech commercialization, exports, getting through, you know, uh, doing incubator level activities. And we have funded all of this stuff. Everything you've heard mentioned here today, we have funded at one point or another. We have funded PTAX, the state portion, after DLA stopped cutting, uh, stopped produce, uh, funding PTAX in a robust way. We have backfilled the state portion of that in some locales. We have created entrepreneurship centers. We have done workforce transition centers where DOL couldn't put some stuff on the ground. But everything I just mentioned, this is stuff that already exists. So it's not rocket science. Ultimately, it's about taking the stuff you have, aligning it correctly with the right people in charge. There's a process for that. We've done a lot of these. We're good at that. Um, but I will also say this about OEA. We don't come in and say, we're the feds. We're here to help you. That is the last thing, and, and, and we do our homework before we go. I once closed a paper mill as, as part of the Department of Labor in northern New Hampshire. I did not show up in a suit. I was wearing hiking boots, hiking shirts, and a polo, and like, hey guys, what y'all doing? That's OEA takes seriously the prep of going into a community first. We're gonna take you where you're at, and you're going to create your own project. The other reason we do that is because we used to mandate an approach. See, a lot of federal agencies work to incentivize behavior. You know, it, you, we want you to do, um, we want you to do this certain health care initiative a certain way. We want you to do green jobs. We want you to do community college challenge. We don't do any of that. Locals will design their own project. In the 90s, we used to kind of mandate an approach because we had seen a lot of stuff that worked, especially regarding manufacturers. And, uh, and then when that project went pear-shaped, everybody broke their arm pointing at OEA. So now we no longer mandate an approach. We go in and say, what do you all want to do? Now we might say to you, hey, that, that worked in Pine Bluff, didn't work in Camden, Arkansas, it works kind of so-so in San Diego. We go a lot of places, see a lot of things. We might be able to coach, but at the end of the day, um, if there's something that local folks know will work, that's what we're going to fund as long as we're authorized to fund it and our mandate is pretty big. All right, so I'm going to flag that we're now at over an hour, so we've got 30 seconds to wrap up. Uh, two points about common themes and challenges. Parochialism, this is why I'm saying if you got the same 15 people and doing the same things for 40 years, take another look at it because we run into this in a couple places. Um, I, I had it. We had a grantee we paid for a strategic plan for. Strategic plan said you need a national outreach effort to do the following, to make the following target audiences aware of the following parts about your economy. They put out an RFP. They got public relations firms to bid. Only one firm had national experience and experience in DOD. They didn't hire that company, even though that strategic plan said they should have. They hired the, they wanted to keep the dollars in the local county. Okay. But, but that's not what is going to get you the biggest buck. That's something to watch out for. And then finally, um, my pet peeve is the not evented here syndrome. Uh, even if it makes sense, we're not going to do it because uh, we didn't think of it first. That's a killer to innovation. And folks who, who are small manufacturers know that better than anybody else. You folks who, who, who own, work in, run manufacturing firms, you're the ones who are going to make the politicians, who are the only people I can award grants to, that you're going to make them understand that better than I am. And I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Glass. All right, well, we are three minutes over, but that's good enough. I see Dion starting to approach, so I'll stop by thanking each of you for the discussion today. Uh, I think that as lunch is being set up, if people do have individual questions, uh, they can seek out the presenter and they'll be willing to have a conversation with you. So thank you again. So can we give them a round of applause, please? I'd like to welcome all of you uh, to greet our next speaker, which is the Dean of the Price School, Saul Price School of Public Policy here at USC. He's the one in which the USC Center for Economic Development is located. And he would like to just give you a few words before we break for lunch. Well, on behalf of the University of Southern California and the Price School of Public Policy, I give my strong welcome and uh, appreciate you participating in this meeting. 
Uh, I realize I stand between you and lunch, so I'm going to be uh, very brief, but uh, probably m most of you don't know that much about the Price School, so I just wanted to say a couple words about it and then our uh, uh, strong interest and involvement in economic development. Uh, we're one of the oldest, largest, and most highly ranked public policy schools in the country. Uh, we're over almost 85 years old now. Uh, we're also a comprehensive school, so we offer an undergraduate degree, uh, five master's degrees, and two PhD programs, so uh, we uh, take kids right out of high school all the way to training those to be academics in the field. Uh, we're also guided by our mission, which is to, uh, it's kind of a simple but noble mission, to improve the quality of life for people and their communities. And uh, we take an interdisciplinary, solution-focused approach to achieving this mission, which means that we have faculty expertise in many areas, including public administration, public finance, uh, policy analysis, nonprofit leadership and intersectoral leadership, social policy, health policy and management, but also uh, just as well in the areas of urban planning, urban economics, transportation and infrastructure, and economic development. That's a huge focus uh, for our school as well. Uh, we're committed not only to doing outstanding research, uh, something that uh, we're mostly known for, and exceptional education programs, but we also want to make a difference in the real world. Uh, we want to play a role of bringing people together so they can have a dialogue on some of the key issues facing communities and we want to produce uh, data and results that are valuable and useful to policymakers, not just to academics. So we house expertise in these interrelated fields. Uh, we reach across the public, private, and nonprofit sectors. We're not just about the public sector, but how they can work together to address some of society's most pressing issues, as well as to plan and develop uh, much better communities for the future. And economic development uh, is a signature area of the Price School. It's a hugely important uh, research and educational area for our school. I know you heard from Assistant Secretary Jay Williams this morning about investing in the Manufacturing Partnership Communities Initiative, and it's important to our national and certainly to our regional economy. So the USC Center for Economic Development, uh, under the leadership of, uh, and very able leadership of Leonard Mitchell, really took up this challenge laid out by U.S. Department of Commerce Secretary Penny Pritzker, who said uh, this initiative was really about nothing less than reinventing how economic development is done through manufacturing. And so the center is engaging our Price School faculty and especially our students in this project to learn about the importance of manufacturing to the economy. And we're soon and in the process of engaging students from the Viterbi School of Engineering as well as the Marshall School of Business. We want this to be a USC-wide uh, effort and bring in those disciplines most relative to the initiative. But just as important, uh, the center is engaging with all of you to help us work together to address the needs uh, of these vital industries, aerospace and defense. And in this regard, we are really looking forward to uh, Mike Quindazzi's presentation on the changing face of aerospace in Southern California and the other pr presentations. I had a chance to hear this last panel. Uh, my assistant's been taking several notes. Uh, it intersects uh, with a lot of the things we're doing and it was, I thought it really informative and I hope you found it that way too. So uh, I wanna thank you for attending. Thank you for participating. But most of all, thank you for committing to this uh, goal and issue of making aerospace and uh, aircraft engineering uh, and manufacture here in Southern California high priorities. So thank you very much.